Hey there, it's Gary Parrish. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, dodo birds, and leaky black. Matt Norlander is here with me. If you're watching on YouTube, smash the like button like your brain and Davies. You have consent. If you haven't yet, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Knock that out while you're here. You have consent. Always. Let's get into it. Wild weekend. College basketball. St. John's upset UConn. Kentucky upset Tennessee. Oregon upset Arizona, Vanderbilt upset Arkansas, New Mexico upset San Diego State. We're going to get to some of that, perhaps all of that before we're done. But I did want to start with Clemson. And that's because the Clemson Tigers improved to 7-0 in the ACC this weekend with a 72-64 win over Duke. Nobody else is better than 5-2 in the ACC, which means we are now 35% through the ACC schedule and Clemson has at least a two-game lead over everybody else in the league, which means Clemson is now in position to win its first ACC regular season title since 1990. As I wrote in the preseason, when you are on the so-called hot seat and pick to finish 11th in your league, odds are you are about to, to coach your last season at that school. That's what history tells us, uh, and that's where Brad Brownell found himself in the preseason, but now he's sitting alone atop the ACC standings. Dead leg, first question, are you ready to call Clemson the favorite in the ACC? Are you? No. <laughs> okay. But I'm willing to consider it. I'm willing to consider it for what uh, it's worth. Game. For what it's worth, Ken Palm right now projects Clemson and Virginia to finish 15-5 and five in the ACC. That would be co-ACC champions. After that, Pitt at 14-6. and six. Miami, North Carolina at 13 and seven, then Duke and NC State at 12 and eight. So right now, according to Ken Palm, Clemson and Virginia should share the ACC title. I'm not ready to declare Clemson the favorite. Uh, the biggest reason is Clemson has played three road games against Georgia Tech, Virginia Tech, and Pittsburgh. It has seven road games remaining. So still has to go on the road. Now it has to play Wake on the road, Florida State on the road, Boston College on the road, Louisville on the road. All manageable. The three toughest, and then we got to wait till we get there. Uh, it's got UNC, NC State, and then Virginia. The last day of February. Hey, who knows? Maybe that game is is literally for first place once we once we get there six or so weeks out. But we come to celebrate Clemson and celebrate we will because life is short but sweet for certain. How about this? Clemson seven and zero for the first time in, in program history. I mentioned on the previous pod it had never been six and zero until this year, and it's pulled that off. Um, Right now, bona fide top 25 team, if you said it, GP, apologies, I didn't hear it off the top, and maybe people listening might have missed it. Did you indicate where Clemson is in your top 25 and one? I did not, uh, but I did put Clemson in at number 25, one spot ahead of number 26, Duke. And I know that might sound low for a team on a seven-game winning streak that is and 7-0 in a power conference like the ACC, but I'll let you continue, and then I'll explain exactly what the problem is with Clemson's resume. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I was thinking to think if Clemson can win on the road Tuesday at Wake, I'll put Clemson – uh, by nature of just being one of the hottest teams in the country. Clemson will be in the top 15 of my power rankings if it wins at Wake on Tuesday. My power rankings refresh every Thursday. Right now, Clemson, bona fide top 25 team. Here's where they are. I don't want to chop you off at your knees here, but I'll just get ahead of this in case you have some of this. Metric check-in as of Sunday for Clemson. Uh, better in, in resume metrics than predictive. So 20th in KPI, 25th in strength of record. So a top 25 team based off what they've done overall there. In predictive, 39th at Sagarin, 54th at Ken Palm, 61st at Torvik. So still more that needs to be proven there. Again, they got to go on the road a bit more and see what they can, they can do there. But getting to this point, big time stuff. Brad Brownell has been able to get this team to 15 and three for the first time since 1718, that 1718 season, that team got a four seed and made the sweet 16. It was also the most recent time that I could, I was trying to think back and I went back and looked at a few things. I'm pretty sure heading into 1718, Brownell was in the hot seat season. Got to make the tournament. You're going to lose your job. Now, had they not, who's to say if that actually, you know, absolutely would have happened, but it didn't happen. They made the tournament. He saved it this year as well. Completely of the understanding and impression that Clemson needed to make the NCAA tournament for Brownell, the winningest coach in program history uh, to maintain his job there. And he's certainly on pace to do that right now by going 15 and three. And I also checked earlier in the day on Saturday I checked the 10 winningest seasons uh, in, in league play in Clemson history. And I, I checked where the, uh, the the teams that were second, third, fourth in the ACC standings across uh, you know the decades, where they 
where they were at a given time in their schedule. And for the ACC, it was an eight-team league for a, a long time. Clemson is a founding member of the conference back dating back to 1953. I'm almost positive that right now, as we speak, Clemson's two-game lead in the ACC is the first time this has ever happened. By nature of Miami getting knocked off at NC State in OT on Saturday, it allowed Clemson, with its win over Duke, to get two games up in the loss column. So not just the first time ever 7-0 in conference play, but I don't think this program has at any point in its history ever enjoyed a two-game cushion in conference play. We're celebrating Clemson's one of the more surprising teams and stories in the sport so far this season. Wasn't projected to be an NCAA tournament team. Wasn't projected to be even top 10 in the ACC. It was a preseason number 11 team. So good on them. P.J. Hall was identified as a top five level player in the ACC. He did have a good game. I just like the way that Clemson showed up, GP, against Duke. Got a good fight from Duke. Kyle Filipowski continues to be a kind of a do-everything guy, and Tyrese Proctor's really coming around for the Blue Devils, but Clemson was not, wasn't rattled really at all. I mean, Hunter Tyson, who had been playing well, didn't play too, too well, but P.J. Hall, again, 26 points. Him and Brevin Galloway stood out there, and I we've seen this from Clemson before. Shouts to uh, OPP, Oliver Purnell, who at one point famously got Clemson to, I think, 17-0 and about 15 years ago. That team... I still believe has the best record from a power conference team to then not make the NCAA tournament. So uh, there is that in its, in, in its history, but I do think Clemson is going to steady itself. It's done enough. I think it'll wind up making the tournament. I'm not going to say it's going to win the ACC GP. I'm not going to say this team for sure right now. I don't know if it'll be a four five or 60, but I think it's going to get in and that's a big win for a program that needed to have a, a big time season and, here we are. No one saw this coming. They have taken advantage so far of a down ACC, and they comfortably are sitting atop the standings. Longtime podcast listeners will remember that I named my middle son after Oliver Purnell. His name's Oliver Purnell Parrish. That's right. You mentioned Brad Brunell being on the hot seat. It, it would be interesting, worth starting a pot, worth worth an A block, if you will, anytime an 11, a, a team picked to finish 11th in a power conference like the ACC is sitting here seven and zero with a two game cushion in the league standings on January 15th. It's especially interesting and worthy when the man coaching it is a hot seat coach. He is literally in the process of saving his job. If you believe the perception that his job was in jeopardy. And I think everybody entered this season under that impression. What's wild is just to go back and read what some people wrote in the preseason, myself included. I Googled real quick, like Brad Brunel, hot seat, and an article popped up, and I clicked on it, and it was from 2014. This guy's been on the hot seat forever. He has. That might have been me. I remember one of the first ones I did for CBS, I put him on the hot seat, and they, they didn't do well, and he didn't get fired. So the, he's, first, he's, the first time he ever appeared on a hot seat, best I can tell, was the 2014 season. We are now in the 2023 season, and he's 7-0 and in the ACC with a two-game cushion. So that so that so that's phenomenal. We'll see where it goes, but that's uh, an awesome story. The reason you can't justify getting Clemson much higher than barely in the top 25 and one is because not only are the computer numbers shaky, as you pointed out, um, the resume is also weird. Clemson is four and one in quadrant one, two and zero oh in quadrant two. So six and one in the first two quadrants. That, that's terrific. No problem there. But they also have two quadrant four losses. They lost at South Carolina, which is ranked 269th in the net. Hey, 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 mm -hmm. hey, hey. How dare you? That's what Shouts they did. To Shouts to Devin Downey. I know, but like, you know, I'm just, I'm just, these are facts. And lost to Loyola Chicago, which is ranked 283rd in the net. That's very hey. unusual for a team that, that's, I, I wonder if this has ever happened. A team is 7-0 and in a power conference with two quad four losses. <laughs> I bet that's never happened. <laughs> I, 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 I never say never. But to your point on the Loyola Chicago, just got in the A-10, terrible this season. Hasn't oh, won in the A-10 game, 6-11. And, and it's not just that Clemson lost. Lost on a neutral by 18 points to a terrible Loyola Chicago team. So you want to know why, if you've got, you know, we're 15-3, and three, why can't we climb up? It's because you got drilled <laughs> by a quad four opponent on a neutral floor and it wasn't even close. That will bring you down. You're going to have to continue to uh, subvert expectations from a metric standpoint to continue to rise and get inside the top 40. Where are you at, ESPN Stats and Info King Jared Burson? Where are you at, Andy Tulin? Somebody look that up. I bet you this is the first time a power conference team has ever been 7-0 in its league with two quadrant four losses on the resume. 
That's very rare for a ranked team at this point in the season to, or any point in the season to have two quad four losses. Um, like, I, as I noted, right now in the top 25 and one, you go through every team. Only one other team in the entire top 25 and one has even one quadrant four loss. And it's TCU. And it was more than two months ago. And it came, as we've discussed in a previous podcast, when two of TCU's top three scores were not available. That's the only other ranked team with one quadrant four loss. So 24 of my 26 have zero quadrant four losses. Then TCU has one and Clemson has two. So that's the issue with the resume. But I just sort of decided the 7-0 and ACC record has to be respected at some point. And I think, I think we finally reached the point after this weekend's win over Duke where that 7-0 and ACC record's got to be respected. Well, I thought you might... And I didn't know where they were. I like to sometimes literally learn this from you on the pod so I can uh, have an organic reaction to it. But, you know, I, I know you probably had to shuffle a ton because and we'll get to this. We'll, we're going to talk a lot about the weekend, but I'll, I, it warrants mentioning off the top in the Clemson segment here and shouts to Andy Tulin for this. It was a historic day on Saturday. So I thought Clemson was going to be able to break in because there was just so much noise. 11 ranked teams fell Saturday and 13 total this weekend with a number next to their name lost and that 11 on Saturday was the most we had ever had the most ranked teams losing in a single day since January of 2011. Now, Tennessee, Miami, Wisconsin, Arkansas, K-State, Providence, Missouri, Iowa State, Duke, Arizona, San Diego State were the 11 teams. Some of those teams obviously vulnerable to dropping out and will officially drop out in the AP Top 25 on Monday, let alone where GP would have had them going into the weekend there. But because we had that much um commotion inside the AP top 25. I mean, ranked teams went four and nine against unranked opponents this weekend. So it, w it was a just okay weekend going in from a slate perspective, but then we got, you know, college football sometimes have this where you've got two or three notable games. And it's kind of like, well, this doesn't look like a great weekend. Then lo and behold, you got upsets happening on the hour. College basketball had some of that. And I thought that's why you would comfortably get Clemson in. I get the argument though. I put them 25 and kind of, being hard to justify getting them higher because as a reminder again if you're kind of just tuning in mid-season or if you've forgotten as we move further along i'm just going to speak for gp's rankings here uh because <laughs> what the hell not Parrish's rankings will more and more reflect resume accomplishments so they will be more in line with bracketology projections totally viable and fair way to do it and so on those grounds on the face of that clemson right now just does not have a top 20 resume in the sport you can't make a case for it Right. Um, but like where Clem and I do believe Clemson will likely break into the AP poll um, because I, I don't think or I, I'm not certain most AP voters even look at it as close as I look at it or care about quadrant four losses as much as I care about quadrant four losses. Like the, the loss column matters to me always just as much as the win column. And I'm not sure everybody ranking teams. I know fans don't look at it that way because. I, I, I'd say 98, 99 percent of fans who tweet me about a ranking. And, and, and they think their team's too low, they will never mention who their team has lost to. They will only mention, hey, we beat this team and this team and this team. Why are we down at 19? Well, because you also lost to this team, this team, and this team. Like, that matters. And so Clemson's loss column matters to me, but I'm not sure it'll matter as much as it um, perhaps should uh, to, to AP voters. And I would suspect Clemson will be in the top 25 poll when it updates on Monday. Either way, that's not the story. The story is that Clemson has a – an opportunity, a realistic chance now, according to the computers, according to your eyeballs, according to everything, to win a, at least a share of an ACC title for only the second time ever and the first time since 1990, which leads me to a trivia time. It's Let's trivia go. time. <laughs> it's trivia time. Turn your brain on. It's trivia time. Who coached right. Clemson to its first and only ACC title in 1990? Uh, give me, um, uh, hold on seeking. Uh, can't, can't cheat. I did. I, I I'm hope not. That, I'm seeking mentally. Hold on. I hope uh, that's understood that cheating is not allowed. Yeah, it's not. I'm, I'm not, I'm not literally thinking on my computer. People watching right now, right here, they can see, uh, come on, man. Coach at Coastal Carolina. I'm blanking. That's Cliff um, Ellis. You got it. That's right. Cliff Ellis. There we go. Thank you. Yes, Cliff Ellis. Cliff Ellis was the coach of that Clemson team. That team was led by Eldon Campbell and Dale Davis. 
They were the top two scorers. Both went on to play in the NBA. Next up for Clemson, got a road game at Wake Forest on Tuesday. So that'll be tough because Kimpon projects that as a 76-75 Wake Forest victory. So Clemson going to have to upset the Demon Deacons on Tuesday to remain unbeaten in the ACC. We'll talk about that one way or another on Wednesday. Meantime, Kentucky and Vanderbilt got the two most notable wins in the SEC this weekend. We're going to turn our attention to that league next. But first, a word from our partners. Don't stop watching Leo Messi, the man, the myth, the legend, Messi! the GOAT. The UEFA Champions League stream PSG matches live February on Paramount+. Plus. So Kentucky and Vanderbilt got the two most notable wins uh, in the SEC this weekend. UK went to Tennessee and, of course, won as a double-digit <laughs> underdog. Vanderbilt handed Arkansas its fourth loss in five outings. Beyond that, Alabama embarrassed LSU by 40. Texas A&M embarrassed South Carolina by 41. Auburn dropped Mississippi State to 1-4 and four in the league. Georgia moved to 3-1 in the SEC. Uh, with a win at Ole Miss. Missouri lost at Florida to fall to two and three in the league. Deadline, we're going to get to some of that stuff, including Arkansas, because you wrote about them in a minute. But first, let me ask you whether you consider Kentucky's win at Tennessee to be a season-changing victory for the Wildcats. I can't. I can't go there. Um, and it, we, there's a chance we'll look back in a month and see that it changed the season. There's that potential. I, I, how about Kentucky putting a bookend on the fact that Tennessee had not lost at home since February of 21 against Kentucky. So it ends, it ends Tennessee's winning streak uh, right there at Thompson bowling. And it does so without like the encouraging part is that Jacob top in return, Seville Wheeler and Damian Collins were not available uh, and their injuries are day to day. Wheeler's got a left shoulder problem and then Damian Collins has a left foot. So we'll see if they're able to return later this week or not. Um, this stat isn't, that's surprising because Kentucky doesn't often uh, have to play a top five team while being unranked. But nevertheless, Kentucky had never beaten a top five team on the road while Kentucky itself was unranked until Saturday. They got that done. And the encouraging part was the fact that Kentucky destroyed Tennessee on the boards. Uh, they got 88% of Tennessee's misses and 41% of their own. And I thought that was good because offensively it was whatever you're playing Tennessee, the best defensive team in the country. Kentucky was at 0.91 points per possession. Um, it was a defensive win. Antonio Reeves comes off the bench and he's able to contribute with 18. Shibwe had 15 and 13 and Kentucky shot well from the foul line. They hit 22 of their 25 foul shots. You know, they were averaging 60 cent, 66% from the line parish going into the game. They shot 88% against Tennessee in a road environment. That's going to get it done. In addition to the fact that CJ Frederick was also key. I mean, he hit three threes. I have, I have the, uh, the stats on this, by the way, we both took over 25% from three and they hit the over, they were at 31.3%. And then I think we split on the over under on made threes. It was the under I had a 5.5. They wound up with five. I think you said over. And I think I said under, but I don't have that. I definitely said over. I went over. Uh, here's what I said. They'll go over. Over and still lose the game. So I was right one out of three. I was right one out of three. My over unders were like they were right in that wheelhouse, though. How about it? Um, Tennessee also missed like thirty eight layups. God, <laughs> they, Lord. they could not stop missing. Lay so I'm giving all the credit to Kentucky for showing up. Calipari running out that um, that lineup with what Reeves, Shibue, Frederick, Toppin, and Jason Wallace. Wallace, thank you. I was like, who's the who's the obvious guy missing? So he puts that lineup out there. Shouts to uh, you know, the Kentucky fans who have been just pining for this, uh, and that that was actually successful there. But it was it, defensively they got it done, and then Tennessee could not stop missing bunnies, man. So I don't think I don't know if it's going to turn Kentucky season around, but no team got a more important win. Just no team this weekend had a more important victory than Kentucky stopping the bleeding getting that victory on the road and doing it all by the, by the way, overcoming, they got off to an eight and O deficit to start the game GP. So where you think like, here we go again. Uh -uh, it wasn't like that. They turned it around. They got it done. You mentioned that lineup um, credit where credit is due. Uh, I, I know Kentucky fans had, had been pining for it. As you say, uh, Evan Miyakawa tweeted before Saturday's game. I don't know if you saw this, that based on his data, 
uh, he thought John Calipari should try with Sabir Wheeler sideline, a lineup of Casey Wallace, Antonio Reeves, CJ Frederick, Jacob Toppin, and Oscar Shibwe. As Evan noted, that lineup was far and away UK's most effective lineup this season, but limited possessions, only 20 Very possessions. limited, yeah. yeah. Very limited. Against UK, I mean, against Tennessee, Kentucky did use that lineup and outscored the Vols 29-14 to 14 when that lineup was on the floor. All other lineup combined outscored the Vols 42-34. So it's awesome that Kentucky might have found its best lineup. But does it concern you that an injury to Severe Wheeler, as opposed to the data, is what led John Calipari to actually start using it? <laughs> I... I, I, I did think about this. I just wonder if the noise around that penetrated through to Kentucky's coaching room in Calipari where he was finally going to acknowledge that. Because most programs, they track this stuff. They are, they are at least on a surface level aware of, all right, with what combination of five guys. Some, guys, some programs will look when we have three-man combos, and regardless of the other two. When we got three guys out there, if it's three, three, are they plus minus? Are they all that stuff? So... The fact that he wasn't willing to do it until it forced him to, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I think he's willing to basically try and, and do anything at this point. And you have to you have to consider what they were able to do. And, yeah, credit to Evan. Uh, and, that, I, that out there. and I should correct myself. Somebody here in the YouTube comments did. I just had it typed in backwards. My apologies. Uh, UK outscored Tennessee 29-14 with that lineup. Okay. The Wallace Reeves, Frederick Toppin, Shibwe lineup, and Tennessee outscored Kentucky 42 34 with the with any other okay. Kentucky lineup on the floor. So, like you put those five guys on the court together, Kentucky's blowing out Tennessee. You put any other, literally any other combination of Kentucky players on the court, and mm -hmm. Tennessee is handling Kentucky. So it, it leads to an obvious question. Is no severe wheeler a good thing? Like, do you uh, I mean, maybe because like what this lineup provides, <laughs> the data is the data from a just basketball perspective. What it provides is you've got an NBA guard with the ball in his hands, two shooters on each side of him, mm -hmm. Jacob Toppin and Oscar Sheboy. Yeah, that's what that lineup is. Yeah. And Frederick, by the way, played 37 minutes on Saturday and his shooting early when they got down eight, nothing like that helped stabilize the team. And I mean, Kentucky can't run one point guard. I mean, like Wheeler's going to get back and he'll be healthy and he'll be on the floor, but might have to be pretty particular and matchups matter teams who you're going against. Like it's, it's more nuanced and we're making it on its, on his face, but undeniably going into this game with limited data, but data nonetheless, it showed empirically that that five was the most efficient. And then lo and behold, they go on the road against the best defensive team in the country. And it proves to work again. It's wild. I, I, I'm I'm interested to see how Kentucky continues to play with that lineup and how often those five are on the floor together moving forward. Well, again, we'll see Wheeler and Damian Collins specifically, guys who are earning plenty of good burn here uh, if they're able to return later this week or how long they're actually out. But uh, Kentucky fans would love to see those players get healthy soon, but I don't think they would be opposed to the idea that Cal is literally forced to run out that five more often than not over the next few games just to see and ensure that that's, um, you know, the most efficient way that they can ensure a, a, a victory, if not staying competitive against teams that right now, from a metric standpoint, project to be better than them. You mentioned um, that you know, most college programs track this stuff. Like obviously all NBA franchises do. And it is not an exaggeration to suggest that NBA front office will front offices will deliver this information to coaches and, and basically tell them, okay, well this lineup does, you cannot put these five guys on the court together anymore. Right. Or, or you need to put these five guys on the court together more. Like, the numbers don't lie. So, so NBA franchises, like, when you watch an NBA game, those lineup combinations are often dictated strictly by this data that we're talking about. Um, like, I don't want to say that coaches don't have leeway to mess with it, but, but they are under guidance, like, st obvious guidance to play the combinations that work and don't play the combinations that don't. And John Calipari, this is undeniable based on the data, has not been playing the combination that works best. And he did it this weekend, and Kentucky got its best win of the season. And if he sticks with it, I, I think there's some reason to believe that maybe that can be a season-changing season win for, for, for UK. But if he falls back into old habits, 
And instead of having an NBA guard surrounded by two shooters, an athlete like Jacob Toppin and the reigning national player of the year like Oscar Shibwe, if he goes back to predominantly putting the ball in the hands of a five foot nothing non shooter, well, then, you know, that will run counter to what the data says. I'm not saying Severe Wheeler is useless, bury him on the bench and never let him play again, but. That lineup that Evan pointed out, that Kentucky fans have wanted, that dominated Tennessee on Saturday, looks like it should be the the preferred lineup in Lexington. So it'll be interesting to see how John handles that when when Wheeler is back and ready to go. On the other side, you know, on Friday's episode, I, I told you we were just sort of talking about the top of the SEC, and I said I thought Alabama was the best team in the SEC because I didn't trust Tennessee's offense. And then Saturday happened. The Vols shot fourteen point three percent from three. And we're held to just 56 points against a Kentucky defense that's still 66th in a, a adjusted offensive efficiency. And Tennessee's offense is now down to 58th in adjusted offensive efficiency. And what history tells us is that it is hard to be a reliably awesome team with an offense that inefficient. You can be good, but can you be as awesome as you want to be to go to a Final Four, win a national championship? It is difficult to do it with an offense. Uh, performing that inefficiently. Loyola Chicago did make the Final Four in 2018. I looked this up with an offense that ranked 63rd. But those Ramblers are the exception, not the rule. And if you are somebody who was skeptical of Tennessee's staying power in the NCAA tournament or ability to march deep into the bracket, well, then what you saw Saturday from them on the offensive end of the court is, is exactly what the skepticism is rooted in. Loyola Chicago in that NCAA tournament got going with a win over Tennessee. The Tennessee Volunteers, coincidentally enough. You mentioned uh, Bama. Just a note on that. <laughs> they, they eviscerated Bama. Eviscerated. My God. Al- Alabama uh, all, <laughs> almost put LSU's program on a show cost um, or postseason, man. 106 66. And. Uh, we are, we'll have many more opportunities to talk Bama. It was the second largest win they'd ever had by margin in SEC history. Uh, they beat Auburn back in 05 by more, 94 to 53. Alabama has outscored its opponents by 114 points so far in league play. It's the best team in the conference. Don't not going to say that's going to for sure be the way, but the way this is tracking, it's Bama. And then, you know, Tennessee is within shouting distance. Obviously, I'm not saying that they, again. Tennessee can't necessarily get there. A and M is actually the only other team right now without a scratch in the loss column, four and zero. But A and M is 47th. The Ken Palm Bama is fourth. Those are the only two teams, Tennessee and Alabama, that sit, I believe, in the top 20 right now. Arkansas is just on the outside of that. And I'll touch on this real quick. And I kind of want your thoughts. So I did write a column on Saturday, just because Arkansas lost again. It lost for the second straight season to Vanderbilt, and the issues we talked about briefly on the Friday pod wound up showing up here. Uh, you know, it was 97, 84 when it was all said and done and Arkansas dropped more than 10 spots in defensive efficiency. Vanderbilt shot 69% in the second half was 66% from three and had 63 second half points. And it's on Friday's show. I said, Arkansas, can miss the NCAA tournament. I put it at 15%. I'm now doubling that. That's at least 30%. Now it's still more likely than not Arkansas is going to dance, but it's got, it's got some issues, man. Like defensively, it cannot continue because I don't think Arkansas offensively is going to be able to get itself consistently to the point you made all of two and a half minutes ago. I don't think Arkansas without Nick Smith Jr. Specifically can get itself to be a game over game over game over game kind of team that can give you 75 plus per night. I just don't think that's the case. Ironically enough, it got 84 on Vandy. Vandy dropped 97 on Arkansas's head. So just reason for concern for a program that, in the past, you know, 23 seasons has only made three consecutive NCAA tournaments once. And that was with two different coaches. It actually has not made the tournament three years in a row under the same coach since the turn of the century under Nolan Richardson. I still think it's going to get there. I still believe Nick Smith is going to find a way and, and make his way back, but there's just some concern. I'm just putting it out there now, 12 and five overall one and four. This team is not winning the sec. It's terrible from three-point range, and now it's got to go play on Wednesday. It's got to play a Missouri team that's lost three of four. 
But Missouri gets the game at home. You know what Arkansas hasn't done yet this season? Hasn't won a road game. So it needs to go and do that on Wednesday to really kind of help turn things around here. I didn't think this was going to be coming. Uh, Maya culpa again. There have been a few. Uh, I was dead on about Xavier's, <laughs> Xavier's prospects in the Big East. But I was way wrong on Kentucky being you know top three good. That wasn't right. And I had Arkansas fifth in the country going into the season. That was a swing and a major miss there. Hogs right now, they're not top 25 level. I don't even know if they're a top 40 team in the country right now. Yeah, I, I removed Arkansas from the top 25 and one. I mean, they're one in four in their past five games. They're never getting Trayvon Brazil back this season. And we'll, we'll see about Nick Smith Jr. I mean, he hasn't played since December 17th, and there is no promise that he'll ever play for the Razorbacks again. Um, this version, like that version of, of Arkansas with Brazil and Smith, that's that's an SEC title contender. This version is a version that's one in four in his past five games and uh, hadn't beaten anybody on the road all season, as you pointed out. So I'm not saying I'm out on Arkansas because I believe in the coach and yeah. Muss has shown the ability to turn things around on a dime, you know, in previous seasons, you know, around this time of the year or later. So I'm not ruling anything out because I believe in the coach, but this team, the ceiling seems to have been lowered uh, because of just bad luck, injury stuff. Um, the Missouri thing is interesting. Uh, Tigers went from 12 and one with a win over Kentucky and a long loss to Kansas to 13 and four after losing three of its three of their past four. They're down to 57th in the net. They're no longer in the top 25 and one. And then you mentioned, um, I mean, and if you're looking for another team like that, uh, it's mm -hmm. Mississippi State. Started 11-0. Now the Bulldogs are 12-5 and after Saturday's loss to Auburn. They've lost five of six. They've gone from 22nd at Ken Palm to 50th at Ken Palm over the past month. A trip to the NCAA tournament no longer looks likely for Mississippi State under first-year coach Chris Jans, but we'll see. And then you touched on Texas A&M alone in second in the SEC standings. 4-0 in the league after beating South Carolina by 41 points. Um, Aggie started 6-5 and with losses to Murray State and Wofford. Now they're 12 and five overall, 4 0 in the SEC, got wins over Florida, Missouri, LSU. So I guess no big, big wins, but still, only uh, other team with the zero in the loss column of the league standings is, is Alabama. So that's good recent stuff from Bud, Buzz Williams. And then one other team I just wanted to make note of in the SEC, Georgia. 13 and four now, three and one in the SEC after Saturday's win at Ole Miss. Only 85 5th at Ken Palm. So the computer numbers are not great, but off to a nice start in the league, relatively speaking. Remember, Georgia only won one SEC game, one, all last season. So Mike has already tripled that with, I believe, 14 more league games to go. He's done a, he's done a good job there. And uh, winning, by the way, at his alma mater, Mike White, former Ole Miss player. I'll also just note that Florida in beating Missouri, uh, it's won three in a row, and the, and the teams that beat, Entered that they, they had an 0 .800 win percentage there. Colin Castleton, you know, he had 16, 13, and 6. And Florida held Missouri to, I think Missouri was averaging like 86 a game going in. They scored 64. So we'll see on Florida. They got a lot more work to do. We'll see if there's some plot twists in the SEC. But it was it was quite a weekend uh, in the SEC. And, and Georgia, if they, if they can just get to 15 wins, which they're going to. Just It's incremental, and Mike White's doing a, doing a great job there. Um, we talk SEC. Let's do a whip around here. Can we yeah. just go – can we can we, can we just talk Big East? Because uh, UConn's loss and then Xavier Marquette, uh, both from – you know, both noisy results for different reasons. But there's a lot to get to. But I just feel like those are the – like, first of all, do you have UConn – well, you probably had UConn ranked going into the day. Will you have UConn ranked come Monday? I will. And still, like, listen, I just, like you noted earlier, I look at resumes. I don't put too much of an emphasis. Let me raise my hand and say, perhaps I don't put enough emphasis on recent play as as much as I do entire resume. I, I, I If somebody wanted to say that's a flaw, I, I'll acknowledge it's a possible flaw. But I tend to look at the entire body of work. UConn's entire body of work is still very much top 20 the computer numbers are still all in the top 20. Um, I, I did drop UConn uh, down to 15, but I still have UConn 15th in what will be Monday morning's uh, top 25 and one. Um, but, you know, they just allowed St. John's to shoot nearly 52% from the field, allowed St. John's to 
win at the XL Center for the first time since 1988. UConn's gone from 14 and 0 um, to uh, 15 and 4. Uh, now four and four in the Big East, so it is really. I thought UConn's problems were mostly schedule induced, like really tough road games. Yeah, but but this is not that. This is a home game against a non NCAA tournament team, and you know, like it it wasn't particularly close. Like St. John's was in control of that for much of the game. Did I hear you right though? Now UConn was out of the Big East for nine years, and some of the games might have been a gamble. Did you say St. John's hadn't won at the XL Center since '88? Yeah, and in fairness, I just pulled that straight off the graphic on Fox at the at the bottom. Oh, it was on TV. That is... <laughs> wow. Now I wonder how many times. Whatever they might have only played at XL like four times yeah. since eighty eight or whatever, yeah. but that's still long, long time, and uh, certainly notable there. Uh, Joel Soriano had nineteen, the senior center for St. John's. He had a game high there, and I did check this after. So St. John's had not beaten a, a road top ten opponent. Uh, you know, in this kind of setting since 2019. And they play, they played well. They had great balance. Six guys wound up in double figures for, for Golden Gate Mike's crew there. And uh, it was I knew UConn was in trouble. I was watching this and along with Finn's Bills on, on CBS. And then, uh, you know, Xavier and Marquette were involved in just an, a tremendous game. But St. John's came out and hit like, 10 of its first 13 shots in the second half. It was just, it was, everything was, almost everything was falling. And it really looked like UConn was going to be in trouble. And yeah, the the road losses are all understandable because of the competition that UConn had to face at Xavier, at Providence, at Marquette. But I, every time I've seen UConn over the past two weeks, man, they, they've been losing. The only game they won was against Creighton. And I watched like four minutes of that sitting in the sitting, eating lunch at Killington, taking a 30 minute break from the slope. So I was like, OK, maybe they're getting it back together. But I barely watched that game for all my per- intents and purposes. It didn't even happen there. They are they are certainly askew at the moment. I think they will get it together. There are teams each season. As a reminder, if you're a UConn fan listening and you're uh, you're a bit in your feels right now. Like I get it, but let's just two things. One, if I told you on Halloween, I said, listen, you're going to get to January 15th and you're going to be a 15 and four team. Are you taking 15 and four or I'm letting you chance it and see how it plays out. You're taking 15 and four and you know it, you absolutely know you're taking 15 and four in that situation Two, there are teams that hit these lulls and then they wind up still getting a quality, you know, two, three, four, five seed. You know, that's a quality seed. Five or better, you got a quality NCAA tournament seed, and they still wind up making a second weekend run, if not a final four run. UConn's got the roster to do that. So I understand why times are a little bit tense. They got to go at Seton Hall, then their home butler, home next Wednesday to Xavier. I fully intend on being in the building. I think that's in stores at Gamble for that one. We'll see. Atop the Big East right now. Well, let me, let, let me stop okay, right me. there because you say that you would take 15 and four. And I think you might. I think you might. Ooh, you think they chance it with that? Ooh. Well, I'll, I'll say this. You, uh, I'll say this. Once you're 14 and 0, there's no way you're taking 15 and four. No, but I know. I, I know that. I know that. I know that's not what you mean. But even at 0 0, I don't know because where are the four losses supposed to be? Maybe two um, at PK-85. It was a loaded field. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think you probably do. Here's my point. I just thought it was kind of funny. Before the Marquette game midweek, we had that on CBS Sports Network, John Rothstein did a pregame interview with Dan Hurley, and it was like, you know, at that point, you kind of lost two of their past three. And John was like, you know, Dan, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to – I'm not quoting, I'm paraphrasing here, but it was like, Dan, you know, it's been a rough little stretch. But if I had told you before the season you'd uh, start 15-2, and two, you would have taken that, right? And he's like, of course I would have taken that. And now we're two, we're two losses more. <laughs> it's gone from 15-2 to, to 15-4. and four. So new question to Dan Hurley, would you take 15-4 and four if I'd have told you that before the season? Yeah. Probably, but mm. the way they've gotten here has been dispiriting. Agreed. Agreed. Um, maybe I'll text Dan. See, I'm sure he'll appreciate that on a Sunday. Hey, I saw you talking to Rostin you know, before Wednesday. I just want to revisit that question. Would you still take this? Would you? <laughs> oh man, um, can almost guarantee the response would not be for the record. Uh, Xavier is undefeated in the Biggie seven and zero. Played a very entertaining game that I met, I think I mentioned on the Friday part, I thought it might get decided in the nineties. It was pacing toward that. And then for whatever reason, just shots started not falling and whatever they went 80 to 76. They cover you and I both went three and two in the final four and one this past weekend, uh, 41 assists total in this game. Xavier had six guys in double figures and Tyler Kolick had another really good game for Marquette. He's been a top five player in the conference this season, but Xavier got a great game out of Jack Nungy who, 
uh, him and Sule Boom are, are two of my favorite players in the country for very, very different reasons. Boom had 16 points, six boards, five assists. Colby Jones had another really good game as well. And Marquette, there's no shame in losing. They played well. Xavier had the home floor. With Providence getting beat by Creighton now, Xavier's the only team without a scratch in, in the lost column in, in conference play there. But the Musketeers will be ranked in the top 10 when the polls refresh on Monday. And I don't have a list of the five biggest stories for you right now in front of me, but Sean Miller returning and immediately getting Xavier through the midway point of the season to top 10 status in the country is one of the five biggest stories in college basketball. He's been there before. He's one of the most well-known coaches. He's one of the most accomplished coaches to not make a final four, but has made multiple elite eight runs, including with Xavier. And my God, what a way to, uh, to announce your, your, you know, your return. Uh, I was just really impressed. It was an awesome game. And it was a fun second watch alongside Dolphins Bills earlier on Sunday. So I don't know if you got any thoughts, but you know, those are the two big East games of note and credit to what X has been able to do here. Now they got to play more on the road. I, I understand that a lot of people are, are ready to maybe slightly fade the muskies a bit. I get that. They've got more challenging stuff coming down the road, but to this point with all they've done, I think that they are playing, they're operating as a top 10 team. Even if you you tell me, even if they don't have a top 10 resume at this point, I mean, I'm not sure they don't have a top 10 resume at this point. I've got them seven in the top 25 and one. I mean, at some point, at some point, you know, you are what your wins and losses say you are. And uh, they're, they're pretty strong. Kim Pom, for what it's worth, now projects uh, Xavier to finish 15 and five in the Big East, win the league outright by one game. So that sure would be something. Sean Miller comes back to Xavier and in year one wins an outright Big East title. The computers, or at least one computer, seems to think that in this moment is a likely scenario to some other notable results from the weekend uh, from different conferences, Arizona lost by 19 at Oregon. Didn't see that coming. TCU beat Kansas state by 14 NC state beat Miami in overtime. I've got the Wolfpack in the top 20, the top 25 and one. Now Providence lost its first biggest game at Creighton, San Diego state. This was a little surprising lost at home to New Mexico. If you have any thoughts on those results or Anything else from the weekend, this would be the place to provide them. Let me send it right back. You team me up, but I want to tee you up. Mm -hmm. What's the one that you feel most compelled to discuss or you think is the most notable of the ones that you just mentioned? I don't think TCU Kansas State really means anything. I still think Kansas State's good. I just think that was a road game against another really good Big 12 team, and so that's going to happen to you sometimes. Unless you're Kansas, then it never happens to you. But, I mean, it does sometimes, but you get the point. I think Arizona losing by 19 at Oregon was the one that uh, created the biggest headline because the Wildcats have now lost two of their past three, and both of the losses are to sub-60 Kenpon teams. It's Oregon and Washington State. And so Arizona's now got this weird resume. They got big wins, or at least a big win. They, they've beaten Tennessee, full-strength Creighton, uh, Indiana, uh, San Diego State, but they've lost to three sub-60 teams, Utah, Oregon, and Washington State. So what do you make of, of that inconsistency? Because that is, that is a resume that screams inconsistency. Yeah, how about that? Arizona right now has three losses to conference foes, all of them unranked. They've got a game against Ucla coming up here that's big. UCLA yet to lose in league play. And so the, the fate of their chances to win the conference actually rest later this week. Arizona is winning games. Man, I wanted to credit that someone on Twitter told this to me. I will. Uh, how about this? If I put this in my I don't I don't have the, the handle right now, but if I use this in my power rankings on Thursday, I'll track down the tweet. And I'll get credit for it. Arizona's winning margin is 16.5 points. In losses, it's losing by 15.7. You want to talk about polarizing. It's either killing teams or getting destroyed. Weird stuff, man. I don't know. It, I, I, I don't really fully have an answer for this. Jermaine Cuisinart had 27 points, uh, the South Carolina transfer. And he didn't even play the first 14 games of the season because of injury. He hit six triples in this one to go alongside and Fali Dante, who almost... Uh, knocked Kirk Carissa out of our known universe with that dunk in that game. Oh, God, that was bad. Top five dunk of the season so far. That was that was real, but that was reminiscent. I just hate, I just hate that it got over. I don't hate, but it got overshadowed. It got overshadowed uh, by Ja. 
Ooh, boy. Do you see that, that was one? ferocious? I did see it. And I also saw the fact that um, John Moran had logged a dunk against every team in the league except his own Memphis and then Indiana and then lo and behold against Indiana. He's like, I'm going to compl- I'm going to I'm going to knock this off the checklist in the most dynamite way possible. Just unbelievable. He's so that into highlights. Crazy. I won't. Yeah, he's so into highlights. I won't be surprised if like in a late season game against the Spurs that they've already got in control. He just decides to dunk on Steven Adams. Just says, you know what? Let me get a dunk on against the Grizzlies real quick. Hey, Steve, Steve-O. Yeah, Steve-O, go stand in the lane. That, that, go stand I, in the I, lane I, and let me punch one on you. Only someone at Memphis, right? That would be incredible if anything like that ever happened. Um, Dante, his dunk reminded me, uh, even though he's much bigger than of the uh, of the Tom Chambers dunk from the uh, from the 80s there. Um he had Dante had 22 and 10 and duck shot 54% from the field. Arizona just has some issues on defense and it's always going to be an offensive first kind of team under Tommy Lloyd, which isn't to say that he doesn't want them or they can't be really proficient defensively, but they've lost something there. And so, yeah, they have gone from this team is one of the two or three most enjoyable teams to watch in the country and a final four contender to suddenly like, let's just figure out what's going on now. Arizona could be like UConn. We could get to the start of March, and they've taken on some losses. But once we get there, you kind of feel like they're in that group of six or seven. You feel most comfortable riding deep into uh, your bracket. So we'll wait and see. But I, I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty notable there. NC State, you said you had them ranked. Uh, let's, you know, good on them. That's the second best scoring team in, in the conference. They they're averaging almost eighty a game. I think only Carolina is putting up more per night. Wolfpack would be in the field of 68 right now. I just want to see a little bit more in a down ACC. I feel like NC state can either take advantage of that or become a victim of it. So let's see three of the next four for the wall for the Wolfpack are on the road. One game you did not mention that I do want to bring up here was the CBS game on Saturday, Indiana beating Wisconsin 63 45. Here's how big that was for Indiana, which has plenty of work to do. Um, Indiana was off to its worst start in big 10 play since 2010, 2010, 11. Wisconsin uh, did not have Tyler Wall, so they needed to take advantage of it. And Indiana, by the way, didn't have Xavier Johnson or Race Thompson. Thompson's now expected to be out until at least mid-February, according to, uh, I think Jeff Goodman had that report first over the weekend there. But Indiana had allowed 84 or more points in three straight games for the first time since 7071, man. That was the year before Bob Knight got there. That's how bad the defense had been as of late. And did you realize, I did not, until I actually found the note over the weekend. Wisconsin had won 24 out of the past 27 games against Indiana. So for Indiana to win 24 out of 27, man. That that didn't even sound possible. That's ridiculous. For Indiana to win 63-45 that definitively, I actually thought it was was good. I thought Kentucky, the teams that, the teams in need of wins that got them and got them in like relatively strong fashion over the weekend, Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois Friday night beat Michigan State 75-66. A line I could really use a morale-boosting win like that. Creighton, you mentioned, still got to build more of a tournament resume, but knocking Providence off the top of the perch in the Big East. And then Michigan on Sunday was able to pull away. It's now it's just 10-7, and but Michigan did beat Northwestern, now 12-5. and I thought those were the teams that got wins that really needed them. Um, only two other ones, I guess. Rutgers beat Ohio. I'm going to, I want to mention that New Mexico state, a New Mexico San Diego state game you mentioned too, but Rutgers has now won seven of his past eight. And in that is a road conquering of Purdue, Ohio state parish, not a tournament team. Not right now. Lost an OT on Sunday, fourth loss in a row before this, they lost at home Thursday night. Remember to Minnesota Rutgers fans will remember. They got maybe jobbed out of that. <laughs> There's maybe, no, maybe you know, 100%. It. <laughs> they got, I know. Yes, he's out of pounds. No, I, I know. I know. I know. I know. So they, so they, they, they go to overtime, they get the win. So they're just like, you know, we, we deserve this. And so the universe corrected itself. Uh, Rutgers is, is doing just fine for itself. Ohio state has now it has a ton of work to do. I mean, this team almost beat Carolina. And if it, it, you want to talk about a season changing outcome for the wrong way, that's Ohio state's been going sideways since that happened. I'm glad that you mentioned New Mexico, though, because it beat San Diego State on the road. That ended the longest winning streak at home in that league at 16 straight games at Viejas there. And that combined with, like, Nevada beating Utah State on Friday, late Friday. Colorado State got a Houdini escape at UNLV. Uh, Mountain West is going to get a few bids here. But New Mexico getting that win, quad one level, is it's better. It's not good for San Diego state. I think it's better for the league. I think that's going to wind up being a a significant victory when it gets down to it. Maybe New Mexico gets in with room to spare, but if it just, if it happens to be near the bubble, 
uh, a win like that one over San Diego State, I actually think winds up being pretty, pretty imp- important. Um, I think that's pretty much it other than Kansas, Iowa State played a great one. I mean, they did. Kansas won. Um, Roy Williams. Roy Williams was there. Did you see that? Roy Williams took in the basketball game. Roy, Roy is at every basket. Like, I, I don't think a basketball game has ever been played in the past two years without Roy Williams and Indy Cats at it. <laughs> They're <laughs> at every game. Both, you know, how, like about you, this? how about this? Each of them, if not both of them, are at a game every single day of the week. Yeah. It feels like it. They can't. They they credit to them. It was apparently um, the 125th commemoration of Kansas basketball. So they had like more than 100 players there, coaches, all that kind of stuff. Grady Dick, 21 points. Jalen Wilson had 16 and 11. KJ Adams had the KJ Adams hit um, hit the bucket to actually win it with like what 11 seconds to go there. Break, breakthrough season. He's let's actually he is. A, He's a dude. He's that guy. Like, he's got something to him. Like he's got great pop, great instincts, good athlete, good scorer, can play both ends of the floor, and just has a knack for knowing how to get a bucket or be in the right place at the right time. He is. He's better this season than I thought he was going to be for sure. GP. Um, before we start looking ahead to uh, the next couple of days, um, I do have another trivia time for you because on Friday night, Matt Painter became just the fifth Big Ten coach. Okay. in history to win 400 games at the same school. I think I know the other four. Is that the trivia time? Is it because you saw it or because I did you not did... see it? I think I know it though. Four other coaches have also won at least 400 games at one big 10 school. Matt Painter became the fifth on Friday. Congratulations to him. Can you name the other four? I'm going to try. Not only do I think I now, I think I can get the other four, and I think I can get them in order. Do you have them in the, in, in the order, or do you just have the names? I have them in alphabetical order. <laughs> I just wanted them to be in alphabetical order. All right. I think it goes Izzo. Tom Izzo is on the list. I think it goes Bob Knight. Bob Knight, of course. I think it goes Gene Cady. Gene Cady. Two Purdue coaches on the list. And I think Lou Henson's the other one. Ding, ding, ding. Oh. Bob Knight at Indiana. Lou Henson at Illinois. Tom Izzo at Michigan State. Gene Cady and uh, Matt Painter at Purdue all have won at least 400 games at one school. Good stuff. Yeah, good on Painter and Purdue alone atop the Big Ten standings and by nature of Illinois beating Michigan State uh, was able to to give them uh, a little bit more a little bit more um, cushion, if you will. What do we got coming? Hey, so Monday is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Kids Don't will tell be home. Me. From Don't tell me. I know Don't we're tell me. excited I, about that. Don't tell me. I was. I was Born in Memphis, Tennessee, where the National Civil Rights Museum is located. In fact, we almost took a field trip to the Civil Rights Museum today. Took our little guys, and then we just oh, yeah. we, and then and then I life caught. That didn't happen. Okay. No. We bet my little guys have never been. My oldest has been. My wife and I have obviously been. People often like even listeners of this podcast will will say, "Hey, GP, I, I, we're coming to Memphis. What should we do?" And um, ultimately, that's up to you. You should do whatever you want to do, but. Absolutely, if you have time, the National Civil Rights Museum is amazing. And Martin Luther King Day is a significant day in the city. And obviously, the Suns and Grizzlies will be playing from FedEx Forum uh, late Monday afternoon in a game that will be nationally televised. And it will have a heavy emphasis on um, Dr. King and and that uh, really incredible museum that's at the site of the old Lorraine Motel where where Dr. King was, was assassinated, of course. Uh, there are traditionally games played, uh, on MLK junior day, uh, in the afternoon. We will have that. I have the schedule in front of me, but if you are well prepared, by all means, feel free well to- on Monday, we've got some daytime basketball. So this is fun. George- Georgetown at Villanova boy, both those programs could sure use a win yep. Purdue at Michigan state. It's two 30 Eastern Georgetown at Villanova noon Eastern battle of the Georges on CBS sports network at four Eastern George Washington at George Mason. Um, and then on Tuesday, we've got um, some really interesting games that I'm going to just keep stalling until I can pull them up. Right. I here have them. Of I have them. Do you want me to I have Can- them. Kansas at Kansas state, <laughs> Kansas at Kansas state. We've got some great games for you. <laughs> these games, I'm telling you. Listen, I have, I, I'm always, I always make these notes. I'm never just looking for it. I have it right here in front of me. But each of my boys, my little guys, had friends come over this afternoon. So we've had four kids in the house running wild, and you're constantly having to break up 
something or address something. And so as I was going through my notes, it says uh, Battle of Georgia, CBS Sports Network for Eastern George Washington at George Mason. So that's on Monday, then on Tuesday. And then the next thing you see is shouts to Devin Downey. <laughs> so I just I just stopped. <laughs> I apologize. It's OK. It's OK. I have them if you need it. I got it in front of me now. We got Kansas and Kansas State at 7 Eastern. That should be terrific. I'll be in the studio for CBS Sports Network watching that with Kansas State alum Brent Stover. He's already fired up. He's flying back from Bangkok and will be in studio with me. He was in two- Bangkok the past week? Dude, this dude got a second job. He There's a there's a MMA, uh, an MMA company that does monthly – shows in asia and it's on amazon prime it's like a big deal like if you you know on thursday nights if you go to amazon prime the first thing video the first thing you see is thursday night football if on friday nights when this is happening you go to amazon prime video the first thing you see is like this mma like mma uh, thing it's like a big deal and so he he fly he literally flies to like taiwan or bangkok or malaysia uh once a month uh, to to call these matches on Friday night, so he is. I, I, I assume he's back by now, but uh, he was a competitive jogger at at, at Kansas State. Ran cross country, which is uh, doubles as co- competitive jogging. So Kansas at Kansas State, that's going to be a lot of fun on Tuesday night. You got Tennessee going to Mississippi State. Yeah, you know, Mississippi State's obviously struggling, but that's still a road SEC game. They those can get tricky. Texas is at Iowa State. Mm-hmm. Alabama going to Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt just got Arkansas, so we'll see what happens there. And then Penn State. Uh, at, at Wisconsin, boy, they need Tyler Wall back because they got to start getting wins again. ASAP. That's that's the notable Tuesday I, night. I, well, I mean, well, I would I would disagree. Some of them. That's some of them. I will just note that Tulane has won five in a row and hosts Houston. Houston, right? On Tuesday, so uh, if Houston is going to get tripped up, you would think at Memphis. At Tulane might be the two games that are most likely where that is to happen. So that's also that's a seven Eastern. Did you see Kendrick Davis's shot on Sunday afternoon? I did not. Did Memphis win? Yes, barely at the buzzer. Played Kendrick, Temple, Temple at Temple. Wednesday. Played okay. one of the Owls, not the yeah, Rice Owls, Wednesday. not the Kennesaw State Owls, and not the Florida Atlantic Owls, but the Temple Owls. Yes. And Kendrick tie game, final seconds. Penny called a timeout. About two seconds to go, something like that. They get it into him, like fade away from behind the basket. Look like a Kyrie Irving shot at the buzzer, like a true buzzer beater. Mm. Really nice shot. Go check the Twitter feed; you'll see it. Uh, good deal. Also, yeah, Penn State plays at Wisconsin. Wisconsin's got to try and, and get a win there. And then there was one more. Oh, I uh, shouts to the Florida Atlantic Owls. One again, got past North Texas. Didn't cover, like I said. North Texas covered. It's all good. And then Charleston also wound up winning. So those two schools have the longest win streaks in the country. And here we go. That is your Monday, Tuesday preview. Yeah, if you're just uh, be aware, if you're going to maybe be around that Purdue at Michigan State, that's a 2.30 Eastern tip on Fox. That's a nice that's a nice tip, man. Purdue's got to go on the road with a two game or one game lead in the, in the Big Ten standings there with Michigan State just having taken the loss there. Rutgers, Michigan State and Michigan all have two league losses. And then uh, I don't have it on it right now, but judging by the chat, apparently Iowa took care of Maryland. So Iowa has been able to turn its season around. At one point, it was eight and six, has won four in a row now. Three of those four have been at home, and they'll have another one at home against Northwestern later in the week. But Iowa seems to um, seems to be getting things going as well. That's all I got, JP. That's all I got. Shouts to Devin Downey. It's right here in my notes. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Huck Larnell. Thank you guys once again for listening to the Eye on College Basketball Podcast. If you're not subscribed, please go subscribe anywhere. You subscribe to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify over at Apple. Five stars, write a nice review. There's more of us than there are of them. If you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel, please, please, please do that. And we're going to talk to you again on Wednesday. Till then, take care.